one of the ways that we can increase productivity is through the division of labor. We've seen that if you can split a job into its key components and people would work in each of those key components and do a very good job at that, we can get a higher productivity. And we've seen that division of labor, we've seen it graphically or illustrated in numbers with this particular table right here where we have a growing number of units of labor, okay? We go from zero to eight units of labor and we ask yourself, well, how much do those people make in terms of output productivity? How much product comes out of the store? We don't have anyone working, we don't make any product. We get one person working, we can make four units. If we get two people, we can make 16. Notice that it's not necessarily connected in terms of two people are much more productive than just one because they get to help one another, they specialize, these sorts of things. So we can see that total productivity tends to rise as we add our workers, okay? Now the thing is, if your plant is only so big or the amount of resources are only so great, you're eventually going to get as much productivity as possible by adding labor. And presumably we can add labor relatively easy in the short term. So what's going to happen is we're going to see total product go up, 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 level out, and then start to decline as we run into the problem of too many cooks in the kitchen. People start bumping into one another. Inefficiencies start running. So we have to ask yourself, what's the most productive level here? Well, if we look at it, you know, the highest productivity in terms of total output is 84, and that's occurring with six and seven workers. You'd probably say, well, you know, if I can get 84 units out with six workers, and if I can get 84 units out with seven workers, I'm probably going to have six workers because you got to pay seven workers if you got seven workers. If you got six workers, you're only paying six workers. So it's better to go to this point right here in terms of maximum output. Okay, this will maximize our output. But that really doesn't say how much we're getting in terms of added output from one level to another. And we can calculate that using our marginal product. And all marginal product really does is it measures how much of a growth did we have from one to two to three to four to five to six. So we can see marginal product just measures the difference between these two. Zero to four is four. Four to 16 is 12. 16 to 36 is 20 and so on. So again, marginal product tends to have this same type of progression where it goes up, 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 maxes, and then starts coming back down again. This is effectively additional workers add a lot more to the point that we start running into uh, inefficiencies. So you'll see here, 20 and 24, that we're approaching the highest marginal product. So the highest marginal product occurs at four workers. In other words, that fourth worker can contribute at 24 units above three. The fifth worker only contributes 15 more, and the sixth worker only nine more, and the seventh worker doesn't do anything for the productivity. So again, marginal product is highest at four workers. We can also look at average product. Now, how much on average is each worker producing? Okay, so if we take the number of workers and we look at our total product, we just divide one by the other and we can get our average product. So two workers can produce 16, that's an average of eight per worker. So you can see here that the average product goes up, 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 maxes, and then starts going down. So again, looking at average product, average product is best at four workers and five workers. So again, you know, the lower number would be better, but the fact of the matter is, is that between four and five, that's where we're getting about 15 units per worker. So we see that the division of labor, the demonstration of the numbers here, show that division of labor certainly helps increase productivity. And why does that happen? Well, there's a bunch of reasons, and you know, here, here are the, the key advantages of why that happens. You know, enhance ability to fit the best person to the job, increased dexterity achieved by the best worker working in the job, um, time saved when workers don't have to change tools or switch machines because they're performing a single aspect time saved that would otherwise be lost moving from one operation to another, the machine specialization. And when the productivity per worker begins to drop, we say we're experiencing something called diminishing returns. In other words, there's less extra benefit product. And the law of diminishing returns is a very important 
concept within economics because it says that when it starts as more and more units of variable resource, in this case labor are added to the production process, at some point the resulting increase in output, the marginal product, begins to decrease. And assuming that at least one other input is fixed. So we're assuming that we have some limitations on other inputs, such as land or such as capital. The reason for the decreasing marginal product of labor is simply that fact, fixed factory size will eventually become overcrowded with workers. You know, the kitchen is only so big. So average, average product will rise if marginal product exceeds it. So if marginal product is still going up, average product is going to go up. Now that makes sense. If you, got, if you wrote an exam, let's say you got 50 on the exam, then you wrote another exam that you got 100 on. You're going to drag up your average, right? You got 50 on one exam, you got 100 on another. That's going to bring your average up. So basically, the average is going to go up as long as the marginal product is higher. Okay, graphically. Now, this is, this is a lot of little graphs here, but really, it's not overly complex how it works. What we're doing is if we measure our total output, okay, this is total product, which is our total input. You'll see one worker produces four, two workers more, three more, four more, five more, right up to the highest. So this clearly demonstrates that right here, between six and seven workers, we've got a maximum productivity. And it starts to decline. Okay. So we can see that maximum production. Now, average product and marginal product, we can see here, if we look at our marginal product, we can basically graph that. But what's important is where it crosses the average product line. The marginal product will always cross the average product line at the average product's highest point. And again, it goes back to the exam. You got to 50 on the first exam, uh, you got 100 on the first exam, and then a 50, it's going to drag down your average. So as soon as the marginal product or the amount is less, the marginal product is less than the average, it's going to drag down the average. So it makes sense that the point of maximum productivity will occur where the average product equals the marginal product. Okay, so that that's a that's an important concept. The point of maximum productivity will occur where the average product and the marginal product are equal. Okay, so here we have a little example of the marginal product here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, I think that I have that one worked out. So just to show you how this works, it says fill in the blank. So here we've got our units of labor and here we've got our total product. So basically one worker is gonna produce 80, two workers 170. Three is going to work an unknown amount. So using, if we have one or the other, we can figure out one or the other. So output, total product, marginal can't be calculated there. But here we've got one unit of labor producing 80 products. So the average is 80 divided by, uh, sorry, the marginal is 0 to 80. So that's 80. So the extra amount of labor we got, and I was getting ahead of myself because the average is simply you're taking your 80 total product divided by how many units of labor, 80 divided by one, will give you 80 right here. This next one here, it's two units of labor producing 170. So how much did it grow by? Well, we went from 80 to 170. That's an increase of 90, okay, so 80. 170 minus 80, that would be 90. And our average product then is simply taking the 170 and divide it by two because 170 units made by two workers. So on average, each worker then is contributing um, about 60, uh, Okay, about 170 divided by two. There's my math skill is really getting me, 85. Okay, so you can 
should be able to fill out this table and based on that, I'll just do this one exceptional one here. So here we've got our marginal product given to us. So 170 and our marginal product is 80. So realistically, this plus this will equal that. So we know that the marginal is the amount of increase. So 80 above that would be 250. That's where we get 250. So you can you can see I've got it finished up here and I've demonstrated 80 divided by 170 divided by 2 and so on. We take it by the number to calculate our average product of labor. Okay, see that? And uh, this is really the same type of question given the data, calculate it. And again, you know, the marginal product of labor, it went from zero to 400, 400 to 1,000, which is 600, 1,000, 1,500, 500, 1,500, 1,800, 300, 1,800, 1,900 is 100. So that's our marginal product of labor. Our average product of labor, we take our total product and we divide it by the number 400 divided by 1, be 400, 1,000 divided by 2, it's 500, 150, uh, 1,500 divided by 3, it's 500. 1,800 divided by 4 is 1,800 divided by 4. 1,900 divided by 5 is 1,900 divided by 5. Okay, so that's the very, uh, basically, understanding of the division of labor and how much labor is produced. Now, if we associate labor with cost, we could add some more calculations into the basic analysis. And here we are sizing up our cost structure. Now, our costs would be associated with, obviously, uh, fixed costs and variable costs. How much is fixed in terms of it doesn't matter if we make one or a thousand. Fixed costs are fixed, and variable costs change with each unit. The more units we make, the more variable costs comes to. So let's take a look at the various types of variable costs and cost structures here. The total variable cost is the sum of all of the variable costs. So variable cost of one unit, two units, three units. That would give you something called our total variable cost. And that varies with directly with the number of output. Our marginal cost is the increase in total variable cost as a result of making one more unit of output. Now, that definition is important because this can be confusing when you calculate it, okay? So the marginal cost is the increase in the total variable cost as a result of producing one more unit of output. And the average variable cost is the total variable cost divided by the total output. Pretty straightforward to do that. So let's take a look at one that's already filled out here. Here we've got, this is what we've been dealing with so far, okay? One, two, and three columns, one, two, and three. So our output units of labor, if we don't have any labor, we're not going to produce any output. Total product is going to be zero. Now, let's have one unit of labor, so one worker. Total production is going to be four. Our marginal production then went from zero to four, so it will be four. The average product is simply the total product that we produce divided by how many people actually were used to make it. So four divided by one will give you your average product. In the second scenario with two workers, two workers can produce 16. Our marginal product is the difference between what we made with one worker and what we made with two. So it went from four to 16. So 16 minus four is 12. In other words, we had an increase in the product of 12. The average product then is to say, okay, here's the total product. There's the total number of workers. 16 divided by 2 would give you an average of 8 per worker. Okay, this holds right down through. So we can calculate the the uh, the marginal by saying how much extra. 16 to 36 is 20. 36 to 60 is 24. 60 to 75 is 15. 75 to 84 is 9, and so on. We can calculate the average and say, okay, well, here's the total divided by the number of workers. 16 divided by 2 is 8, 36 divided by 3 is 12, 60 divided by 4 is 15, 75 divided by 5 is 15, and so on. So that's how we calculate that. So those should be pretty self-explanatory how we, how we get those numbers. The total variable cost. In this particular case, then, 
these numbers be given to you, or it, they could have simply said in this problem, which they didn't, there's no indication that they did, but you can calculate it. Ask yourself, how much is each unit costing extra? Okay, so what is our total variable cost per unit? So our variable cost per unit. Well, we went from zero to one, and our extra cost went from zero to 120. So the per unit variable cost, in this case, would be 120. And you notice, we'll make two units, is two times 120. We make three units, it's three times 120, and four times 120, and five times 120, and six times 120, and so on. So effectively, the variable cost per unit is 120. So the more units we make, the more the variable cost, and it would increase at $120 per extra unit. Okay, so this is where the total variable costs come from. Now the marginal cost, marginal cost, if we go back to the definition, and again, this is one that gets confusing, is the increase in total variable cost as a result of producing one more unit of output. Okay, so we went from zero to 120, okay? So our total variable cost increased by $120, going from zero units to four. So notice that it says per unit or one unit of output. So the marginal cost per unit is 120 is the extra, four is the extra units, 120 divided by four would give you a marginal cost of $30 per unit, okay? Do one more just to kind of show this. Our units went from four to 16. That's 12 extra units, okay? Four to 16. And our total variable cost from, went from 120 to 40. So that's a $120 increase in variable cost for an extra 12 units. 120 divided by 12 will be 10. So the unit extra per unit extra cost. Look at this one. It went from, in this case, <clears throat> total production went from 16 to 36, which is 20 extra units and 120 extra dollars to go from two to three. From output, you know, it's labor output, two to three. So 120 divided by 20 will be six. So we got that marginal cost is not complicated. It's just you can get tripped up on it very easily. So be careful with that one. Our average variable cost, we go back and look at the definition again, is the total variable cost divided by your total output, right? So our total variable cost right here, total output right here, 120 divided by four, 30. 240 divided by 16, 15. 360 divided by 36, 10. So this is would give you your average variable cost. Now it's important to note, again, looking at that, that they'll follow kind of a, I'll call it a standard, standard uh, pattern, okay? Total variable cost will increase linearly because it's $120 extra for each. Marginal cost will be higher decrease, 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 hit a minimum, and start coming back up again, okay? And average variable cost will decrease, 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 hit a minimum, and start coming back up again. <clears throat> so we have a, a low point for marginal cost and a low point for average variable cost to give us an indication of lower cost. Okay, really what we're looking for, if we're asking ourselves, you know, okay, what's the most productive point? Minimum costs are certainly things that we're going to be looking at. We're going to want to keep our costs as low as possible. So looking at a marginal cost, the lowest level of production here, the lowest cost at a level of production would be at four units of production. The average variable cost would be lowest, eight and eight, at four and five. Both of those would be considered as the lowest 
variable cost. We can also, and it's often helpful, to take this basic bit of information that we have here and graph it, okay? So we can calculate, for example, our marginal product and average product. So here's our marginal product, here's our average product, and if we graph them, so here's a graph here of that. You can see, again, same type of pattern that I noticed before. The marginal product increases and starts to decrease. And you'll notice that it crosses the average product at the most, at, uh, basically, as soon as marginal product crosses the average product, average product starts to decline. So effectively, when our marginal product matches our average product, that's the point of what we call maximum productivity. So our average product matching our marginal product. So our average product and our marginal product match here at five units. That will be defined as our point of maximum productivity. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we can also measure our costs in a similar way. In fact, you're going to notice that our marginal cost and our average variable cost tend to be mirrors, or inverted mirrors, I'll call it, of this same thing. Look, you can see, for example, that the cost structure works in the exact opposite. As I showed you a little bit earlier, the marginal cost, an average variable cost are here, and you'll notice that in this particular case, the marginal cost crosses your average variable cost at its lowest point, because once, once, it, once it basically crosses the average pot, cost point, costs start to go up. So the minimum average variable cost by definition, occurs at the point of maximum productivity. Okay. So these are some of the key things that you need to, to look at. And I've just basically put in the, um, the little mathematicals here. Total costs are made up of fixed cost and total variable cost. Average total cost is total cost divided by output. And marginal cost, change total cost over change total output. So we've got We've got some um, some examples there, and I want you to take a minute now to look at this one here. Assuming that all units of labor cost the same, fill in the blanks in the table here. When is marginal cost at a minimum? And what is the marginal product of labor when four units of labor are used. Okay. Now I want you to take a couple of minutes and just see if you can uh, see if you can uh, consider that one.
We can certainly do total variable cost easily. Okay. So if we, we know that um, if we know that variable costs are constant, it does say that if we assume labor costs are the same, fill in the blank. For one unit of labor, total variable cost is 200. So for two units of labor, it should be twice that, two times 200. Three units of labor, three times 200, four times 200, five times 200, and six times 200. So that would be two, four, six hundred, eight hundred, thousand, twelve hundred. So that would be the uh, the basic change in that. Marginal cost is always the one that's most challenging. Okay, so keep in mind now what marginal cost is. Marginal cost, by definition, is the increase in total variable cost as a result of producing one more unit of output. So in this particular case, our units of output grew from 0 to 100, and our total variable cost went from 0 to 200. So if we think about that, then, our marginal cost, or the additional cost per unit, is running at about $2 per unit. So our marginal cost here is $2 per unit, which is 200 divided by 100, because we need to say what is the additional cost for each unit of. So that would be $2. That would be 400 divided by 220, 600 divided by 320, and so on. And that would give you the marginal cost. In fact, I've got them worked out over here. And you can see it would be 2, 1.662, 2.5, 3.33, or 3.73, whatever I got written there, and 1. So that would be your marginal cost right there. And the average cost is simply taking your total cost and dividing it by your output. So 200 units in this particular case, dividing by output, 200 divided by 1, or 400 divided by 220, or 600 divided by 320, 800 divided by 400, 1,000 divided by 460, 1,200 divided by 480. So that will give you an idea how to do that. So these, these tables then can be filled in by completing those by doing the math on that basic data, okay? The, uh, you can also plot that bit of information here that could be plotted along here, and you can see that the marginal cost line is this one that really kick, the really kick, because what it will do, it will always cross at the lowest point in the average total and the average variable cost curves. And in fact, these points have names on them. The, the lowest average variable cost is the most productive output, okay? And the, the lowest average total cost would be what's called your economic capacity. That's how much the firm, that's how much the total capacity of the production facility is at that fixed point in time, assuming no other factors productions can change. And you can see that diminishing returns start at the lowest point in the marginal cost numbers, or start our costs start to rise. This is important. You're gonna these terminologies will come up again. So uh, there's lots of these little uh, tables to fill in here uh, in terms of this, and all we're trying to do, all we're trying to do here, is to find what will be the best 
level output to operate at. So, you know, if you're saying, what is the purpose of this? The purpose is to find our minimum cost to look for these bunch of things. What is the economic capacity of the firm? What is the most productive output? And when do diminishing returns occur? Okay, so you should be able to identify them by doing these exercises. Now, I've got another one here. We've done several of them now. I'll leave you to that and have it all keyed out there as well. Okay. Couple little, uh, so that's the mechanics of that chapter. Couple little things I just wanted to clue up with here, and that is how can a firm cut costs? That's ultimately the question that all firms will have. Look, we gotta be able to get more efficient, we gotta be able to do things better, we gotta be able to get more bang for the luck. What can we do? So when a firm speaks about cutting costs, so what it's really saying is, you know, and why is it really saying that? It's really saying that we're gonna cut our average cost and our total cost. Because if you think about our firm, the more it produces, obviously its costs are gonna go up because as you add, as you produce more widgets, you gotta pay for those, the contents in those widgets. So the more products you make, your costs are gonna go up with each additional product. There's a variable cost each unit. What we're really talking about in terms of cutting costs though, is cutting the average costs, get those down. So if you think about this in the airline industry. The airline industry, I like the airline industry because the airline industry is all big, big, big money. You know, a 737 like that is a $120 million airplane. You got to make it fly and you got to make it pay for itself. And one of the things that can happen to make it pay for itself more quickly is for it to be less costly to fly. So the 737 MAX, yes, this is a controversial one that crashed and was out of service for over a year. But the 737 MAX is all about cutting costs. Really, that plane there, in terms of the inside, and when you and I go and sit in it, we would know the difference between it and another 737. Really, there's, you know, for a passenger sitting in the seat, they would not know the difference, Okay. So it, there's a hundred and depending on how long it is, there's different versions, different lengths of 737s. But generally, you're sitting about 130 people in that plane. And all of this is about cutting costs. The airlines are all about how can we make money? Well, if the planes are the same, we're going to fly the least costly one. The MAX has promised to save 8% up. 8% fuel cost. Basically, it's flying on less gas. Okay. And even though it's $120 million, airplane companies are going to say, we want to buy this plane and take our old ones and, and turn them into pop cans. Because the fact of the matter is, is that we're all about cutting costs. That's how we make money in the airline industry. And cutting costs means having brand new airplanes. So technological improvement is what sells it. And the MAX has been sold and marketed on the fact that it's a less costly airplane to fly. So companies are going to fall over themselves looking to buy these machines. In fact, if you look at the number of orders for those planes, it's quite high. Uh, we have um, a couple of sample problems at the end that's all about calculating these final costs. So I'm going to leave you guys to do those.